Today, we are busting off over 950 horsepower on a naturally aspirated small block that isn't even available to the general public. Except, we're going to tell you how you can be the first. When it comes to NASCAR racing, Chevrolet has had a ton of success, including more championships than all the other manufacturers combined since it introduced its purpose-built race engine, the R07, back in 2007. Now technically, anyone is supposed to be able to purchase any and all the parts necessary to build your own NASCAR race engine, but the truth is that just hasn't happened. And really, the only place you've seen Chevrolet's purpose-built stock car racing engine is in NASCAR's highest divisions. By the way, this obviously isn't real NASCAR footage. I'm too big of a Scrooge to spend the coin to license real deal NASCAR video. But anyhow, the fact that these engines are unobtainable may be about to change. In the next couple of years, NASCAR is expected to revamp its engine package. Now right now, we don't know what that's going to look like. But what we do know is that as soon as that happens, the current crop of race engines are going to be obsolete. And so the market is going to be flooded with some really high quality, high horsepower race engines and parts for affordable prices. And that's a good thing for us. That's why I was excited when Dennis Borum, the manager of Pro Motor Engines in Mooresville, North Carolina, invited me into his shop to check out an R07 they had built for street strip purposes. I've known Dennis for years, but we've never been able to do any videos together. That's mainly because Pro Motor, and many people also know it as PME Engines, has been a top flight NASCAR Cup and Xfinity engine builder for years. Now unfortunately, the current political climate in NASCAR is that all the manufacturers want their engines coming from a single source. So for example, if you're a Ford back team, your engines come from Roush Yates engines. If you're a Chevrolet team and you're backed by a Chevrolet, they're either going to come from Hendrick Motorsports or ECR. Now I kind of think that goes against the grain of competition, but hey, what do I know? And they wouldn't listen to me anyway. What that meant is that previously, ProMotor was almost completely a cup engine shop. They were very successful at it, but by necessity, they also had to be pretty secretive, so they didn't do a lot of other projects. Now they have the capacity to build some pretty kick-butt engines for us regular folks. Make no mistake, ProMotor is still building competitive NASCAR race engines for their privateer teams, and they're doing well with it. They are just now looking into putting their skills they've developed over the years racing and winning in NASCAR to help teams in other disciplines and even street guys looking for tons of power. Here's how Borum explains it. We build engines for um, all the way from the Cup Series, Xfinity. Um, truck Series is mostly all Ilmore engines now, so we, we, we used to have a big presence there, and that's not now. Uh, Trans Am, road racing, vintage racing, um, grassroots racers will come in. We do quite a bit of machine work for, uh, for professional and, and people that do one-off projects at home. Um, so it's, it's kind of, if you came into the shop 20 years ago, it was primarily, it was probably 100% either cup or road race. And as time, as time has went on, the consolidation of race teams, engine shops, um, we've had to find better, more ways to diverse ourselves, you know, to basically keep growing. And that's where it's, that's where it's went. So the idea they had was to take R07 components that it had enough laps on them to be retired from competition and use them in a couple different street builds for their customers. The one we'll be looking at is the most aggressive. It's a no holds barred Stroker R07 built for some street use that will also be an absolute killer on the drag strip. Promoter has stacks and stacks of race engines of all types all over their facility. So even though we're checking out a used build, all the components have been checked over thoroughly and matched together to get the best end result. All the machine work and blueprinting is done right here in ProMotor's extensive CNC department. Anyhow, let's get started. ProMotor uses specialists for each stage of the engine build, so you'll notice the engine in different work areas as we move along. Also, it's important that I let you know this isn't the exact same engine all the way through the process. ProMotor did a lot of development and testing on the street strip engine, and I came on board for the dyno sessions. 
but since really the only difference is a bit more stroke on the crankshaft, I can show you the assembly of other RO7s and you can get the idea. That's why you may notice some small differences like oil pan color between the assembly shots and the dyno session. Right away, you'll notice that the RO7 block doesn't look like any other Chevy small block. The casting is very sculpted to save weight. The iron is also a compacted graphite material that is incredibly strong compared to standard gray iron. One major difference with this block is the bore centers are just a bit wider. The standard 4.4 inches between the center of each bore has been expanded to 4.5 inches. Now that may not sound like much, but it allows not only for a bigger bore and larger pistons, but it also makes room for larger, better breathing valves, which we'll see in a minute. Here, the crankshaft has already been placed in the block, but you can see the quality of the Bryant billet steel crank we're using. For NASCAR applications, the maximum stroke is three and a quarter inches, but since we're no longer constrained by their rule book, which mandates a maximum of 358 cubic inches, ProMotor had Bryant lengthen the crank's throws to three inches six hundred thousandths with the billet crankshaft they built custom for this project. Also, check out the billet steel main caps. All five caps utilize four studs to secure each to the block. The mains, by the way, are just two inches in diameter to help cut parasitic drag. Also, from this angle, you can see the piston squirters bolted to the bottom of each cylinder bore. They are fed by an internal pressurized oil gallery to provide a continuous cooling stream of oil to the underside of each piston. This is a great feature of the R07, but unfortunately, we found that the stroker crank promoter used for their big inch build the rods hit the squirters, so they had to be removed. The rotating assembly is straight up NASCAR. Rules limit the minimum weight for both the connecting rods and the pistons, so they can't be too extreme. The pistons, for example, have to be at least 400 grams each. Now the H-beam connecting rods are from Carrillo. They are 6 inches 200 thousandths from center to center with a tiny 1 inch 850 thousandths rod journal to minimize bearing speed. Short block specialist Tim Ambrose already has the molly coated pistons installed on the connecting rods here. Notice how precise he is with the application of the assembly lube on the coated cleavite rod and main bearings. The molly pistons are also fully coated. They are 5 thousandths over the NASCAR maximum at 4 inches 190 thousandths. So with the 3 inch 600 thousandth stroke, that brings displacement up to 397 cubic inches. Here you can see the very precise reverse dome that both brings the compression ratio within spec and also serves as a valve pocket for both the intake and exhaust. NASCAR mandates a maximum compression ratio of 12 and a half to one. So even though the stroker crank is swinging the pistons an extra 350 thousandths along its arc, changes have been made to keep the compression ratio pretty much the same. And to keep detonation at bay, that means we'll be burning 112 octane race fuel. The pistons may look pretty standard at first glance, but they actually have a very trick feature. Cup teams have found that they can save horsepower by opening up the connecting rod side clearance between the big end of the two rods and the cheeks of the crank's rod throw. To manage this, the pistons pin bosses are moved inboard to control connecting rod movement. This also makes for a shorter wrist pin, reducing the overall weight of the rotating assembly. Ambrose checks the bolt stretch and tightens each to 57 pounds to get the designated six thousandths of an inch of stretch. And once the short block is all together, he CCs the piston and the bore at TDC to confirm that everything is correct. After Ambrose signs off on the short block, it's moved over to Paul Topzuski's area for installation of the camshaft and timing gear. The cam is a solid roller cut from billet steel. Notice the narrowness of both the lobes and the cam journals, done in an attempt to further reduce rotating friction. Here's a pretty noticeable change from an original small block Chevy. The camshaft timing gear is at the front. The original plan for the R07 put the distributor up front which helps reduce timing fluctuations from camshaft twist. 
we're actually sticking with a real deal NASCAR Cup Cam load pattern. Because of that, Borum preferred to keep the actual specs to himself, but he did give us some rough numbers, and this bump stick is daggum big. We're talking somewhere around 280 degrees of duration for the intake valves at 50 thousandths tap at lift, and 286 for the exhaust. That's on a 110 degree lobe separation, which should make for some big overlap. And with a super aggressive 2.0 to 1 rocker ratio, we don't know exactly how much valve lift this engine has, but Borum did allow that it's over 900 thousandths of an inch. That's a deep breather. The cam bore is also raised in the block, and here you can see the roller bearings that are used to eliminate every last bit of parasitic drag. Also, if you look closely, you can see how the cam tunnel is fully enclosed along the sides and the bottom. The oil is sucked out by the dry sump oil pump directly from the cam tunnel so that none can drip down onto the crankshaft and cause any power robbing windage. The timing set is fully adjustable and uses a cogged belt to ensure zero slippage. Borum says it's also incredibly durable. Remember, even though this is full race, NASCAR Cup motors are designed to run 600 miles or more at 8500 plus RPM. So in many ways, they're actually overbuilt for street duty. And once everything is installed, Tobzuski degrees in the cam. With the cam in place and degreed in, the engine moves over to the cylinder head and valve train area where Kevin Weidman takes over. The timing cover for the R07 is carbon fiber and the block lacks any motor mounts. Instead, this motor mount plate bolts to the front of the block and then bolts up to brackets in the front clip of the chassis. So for street use, some chassis modifications may be necessary. After painting the multi-layer steel head gaskets with a copper coating for improved sealing, Weidman slides them over the head studs. You'll notice there are 16 head studs here, but that's not actually all the fasteners securing the cylinder heads to the block. The R07 also uses an additional four more studs per head that thread into the cylinder heads and extend into the deck of the block. Chevrolet obviously was not taking any chances when it comes to blown head gaskets. But while we've got the heads out, let's take a closer look at them. Notice that the R07 heads have an LS7 style alternating valve arrangement. The valves, by the way, are all titanium with super light 7mm valve stems. The intakes are sized at 2 inches 210 thousandths and angled at 11.5 degrees, while the exhausts are an inch 625 thousandths in diameter with a 7.5 degree valve angle. These gorgeous combustion chambers, meanwhile, are approximately 40 cc's. But before the cylinder heads can go on, Weidman must install the roller lifters. These solid rollers don't use link bars like you might be used to. Instead, they're keyed to keep them from rotating in the lifter bores. Notice how the Bush lifter bores have a keyway cut into them. These are precisely located so that the key in each lifter body fits precisely and properly orients the roller wheel parallel to the rotation of the cam. The lifters are also extra large at 935 thousandths in diameter, which allows for a larger roller wheel. That's necessary to withstand the super aggressive lift ramps on the cam lobes. You can also see how the lifter bores are given different locations for the intakes versus the exhausts. This is a holdover from the old SB2 race engines to improve valve train geometry. So now let's put the cylinder heads on. Here you can see how the short studs extending from the cylinder heads slot into the block just above each bore. Promoter also wants to keep their intake port designs to themselves, so that's the reason for the black plates. But the exhaust ports were open, so here's a good shot of the port work for them. Up top, the heads have a large flat area to mount up the rocker stands. A really nice touch is the o-ring that seals the valve covers to the head so the gaskets aren't necessary. The valve springs are sunk down into the head so that when the engine is running, they are constantly bathed in motor oil. This helps keep the springs cool while also providing a dampening effect against harmonics. Pro Motors using a nested valve spring with titanium retainers holding them in place. Like the cam specs, I only got general numbers, 
but I'm told they're in the range of 780 pounds at full lift. Wyman sets about tightening the bolts on the head studs. They are a variety of different diameters depending on position, so they torque to different levels. Also, because of the unique shape of the head casting, many are in locations that just can't be reached with a socket, so Wyman has to use a crow's foot. This includes the studs that extend from the deck of the cylinder heads into the block. Torquing the heads took quite a bit longer than it does on your standard short block, but that's to be expected. It's obvious that the R07 design prioritizes performance over ease of assembly, but nobody at Pro Boater seems to mind. At least none of the head studs have to be accessed through the intake ports like the old SB2 race engine. And that focus on performance at all costs extends to the rocker arms and the rest of the valve train. To shave critical ounces from the valve train mass, the rocker arms aren't equipped with adjuster cups to set the valve lash. Instead, the engine builder has a few different options to get the proper lash. The rockers are secured to the top of the head with a set of steel rocker stands. The height of the stands can be adjusted with shims that are a variety of thicknesses. Weidman measures each shim to make sure he gets exactly what he wants. Then the rocker stands can be dropped over the studs. Once that's all set, the nuts are tightened down on the quarter 20 studs. The narrow 7mm valve stems don't provide enough surface area across the top of the stem for the tip of the rocker to roll over, so lash caps have to be added to the top of each stem. Promotor has these in a variety of thicknesses, from 50 thousandths to 90 thousandths of an inch, which they use to set the lash. However, this is a secondary adjustment. They actually prefer to start with a 70 thousandths thick lash cap across all the valves. Although all the different size caps are separated into bins, Weidman checks and confirms each with a dial indicator on a fixture just to ensure that no mistakes are made. The lash caps just pop right on top of the valve stem tip. Since they are CNC cut from steel, they're also more durable than the titanium stems and significantly reduce wear. This gizmo is a feature to measure the length of the push rods used with extreme accuracy. Push rod length is the primary tool for setting lash here. Because of the raised cam tunnel, the R07 uses some pretty short push rods. For this build, they are 7 sixteenths of an inch in diameter with 165 thousandths wall thickness and are approximately 8 inches long. But even a stack of high-end push rods, all labeled 8 inches, can vary by a thousandths or two. When you are using a 2.0 to 1 ratio rocker, the thousandths of an inch of variation in pushrod length can make a real change on the lash side. So Weidman mixes and matches the pushrods until he gets the correct lash he's looking for. Then the steel rocker arms can be installed. It doesn't really apply to us here on a street build, but there's a reason why a promoter prefers to use pushrod length to dial in the valve lash in the assembly room when it would be so much easier to do it with the lash caps. That's because they want to leave as much adjustability in the lash caps as possible in case any lash changes need to be made at the track. As long as the lash cap is still in the center of the range, it allows the engine tuner plenty of options at the track if the lash changes or needs to be adjusted. But if the lash cap is already maxed out in one direction or the other, the tuner has to take on the much more difficult and time-consuming task of swapping out push rods at the track where conditions aren't the cleanest and time can be at a premium. Once all that finicky work is done, the valve covers can be bolted up. The R07 uses cast covers with valve spring oilers that are built in internally. The covers pick up oil from the cylinder head, and you can see that in the top right hand corner, and then route the oil to the internal sprayers through galleries cast right into the cover. It turns out that keeping the valve springs from overheating is critically important for eliminating failures in endurance racing. And finally, we get to something on this engine build that's completely unlike anything you're going to see at a NASCAR track. Promotor regularly builds custom intakes for local drag racing teams, so it was nothing for them to whip up this dual quad tunnel ram intake from aluminum. Up top, they've bolted up two completely stock Holley HP 750 double pumper carbs. They have number 74 jets in all corners, by the way. 
Also, you'll notice the one inch open spacer under each carb. If you have a sharp eye, you'll notice that the intake manifold is completely dry, meaning it has no provisions for water. That's because the R07 uses a separate valley cover that routes the coolant from the cylinder heads to a port where it can go back to the radiator. That's what the set of holes underneath the intake ports are for. Anyhow, enough of that. Let's get to the dyno and have some real fun. We're using Promotor's standard dyno headers. They are racing style headers with a tri-wire collector and are sized at an inch and seven eighths primaries, stepping up to two inches. Also, the oil pan may look like a big wet sump pan, but it's actually not. The R07 has no provisions for an internal oil pump. We're running a five stage external pump with a NASCAR cup style dry sump oil pan and believe it or not, an external oil tank capable of holding six gallons of motor oil. So let's get to it. Dino operator Dennis Sederko has literally made thousands of pulls with R07 strapped to the table, so he had us up and running in no time. With the big NASCAR cam, this engine really isn't meant to make power in the lower RPM range, so we didn't even begin the pull until 5800 RPM, you know, where most engines have already given up. But we let it rip all the way to 8800. Now I don't know about you, but I love listening to a high RPM V8 thing. So how did it do? Well, from the jump, the dual carved R07 was making 622.3 foot-pounds of torque and 689 and a half horsepower at 5,800 RPM. And it just went up from there. Peak torque came at an incredible 6,700 RPM when it hit 655 and a half foot-pounds. And we didn't hit peak horsepower until 8,300 RPM where we saw 955.1 on the meter. We were less than 45 horsepower away from a solid grand on a carved, naturally aspirated engine that's less than 400 cubic inches. This thing is amazing. After looking over the numbers, Borum said he believes this engine is wanting even more air and could easily break that 1,000 horsepower mark with a pair of dominator sized carburetors. Unfortunately, we didn't have an intake on hand for that, but we did want to do some more testing. So we went the other way and installed for comparison a NASCAR cast aluminum race intake and a race prepped Holley 830 CFM carb. The intake is what is used on NASCAR's mid-sized ovals, usually a mile and a half in length. From extensive testing, Soderco already knew the setup works best with a two inch open spacer between the carburetor and intake, so we installed one of them on there too. So let's go for round two. Maybe not surprisingly, we really didn't lose too much when it comes to the torque curve. Even the peaks didn't really change, 656.9 at 6500 to 655.5 from the previous pull. Horsepower, however, 
was down from about 6,600 RPM on upward. Peak horsepower was still strong at 924.1 at 8,300 RPM, but that's still a loss of 31 horsepower. Obviously, this 397 cubic inch build with parts right off the NASCAR cup shelf is not ideal for puttering around town and picking up your groceries. This engine means business. Now, Borum makes no excuses that this is a high power build for a street car that's set on kill for the drag strip or road course. In fact, believe it or not, it makes a couple hundred more horsepower than the current fuel injected cup engines because NASCAR has them so choked off these days. But if the idea of running a NASCAR engine in your hot rod appeals to you, but you're looking for something a little more friendly as a daily driver, Borum says he's developing a version that still makes great power, but it's more street friendly. This one will have a custom molly piston that knocks the compression down to 10 and a half to one so it can burn pump gas. And the camshaft duration will be tightened up to around 255 for the intakes and 260 for the exhaust at 50 thousandths tap it lift. And that should move power lower in the power band in the RPM range. Now it's still projected to make 750 horsepower and over 500 foot pounds of torque. So it definitely will still be a beast. Please leave a comment below and let us know which version you would go for. I can't wait to see what the guys at Pro Motor have coming up next. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to check these out too. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time for more horsepower.